Thanks everyone for joining us today here in the Zoom room as we unpack chapter 18 of Jeremiah. If you haven't yet read it, please pause your playback and then read it and then rejoin us. Thanks. Welcome back. Let's dig into it and find out what God has to say to us as 21st century people wherever you live. And for those on YouTube, from wherever and whenever you are watching us. Today we learn about a potter's wheel and about imprecatory prayer. That phrase may be new to you, but I doubt that it is in itself new to you. The driving spirit is not new to you. We'll talk about it in detail through the reading of this chapter and we'll listen deeply listen to the heart of the prophet. Let's dig in. Verse 1, God sends Jeremiah on a maybe a purchasing mission or a show-and-tell mission to visit a home and watch a workman work. The object lesson which follows concerns a potter who's working on the wheel. You might already know how this occurs. You watch the movie Ghost. A potter takes a lump of clay and kneads it with his hands while his feet are pumping and the wheel is turning. Now, actually, at least one wheel, probably two parallel stone wheels. They would have been joined by a single shaft in those days. The story is that the clay, in a way, resisted the molding by the potter and the product, the vessel that the potter was making, was ruined. If that happens, the potter simply adds more water to the lump and strongly remolds the vessel, remolds the lump actually into a new product. Do you remember working with Play-Doh? It's the same process, although more particular and would require much more skill. Apparently this was a lesson to Jeremiah about God being the potter and Israel being the clay. He wanted to mold us into an object for public use or for representation of his character or his person to the rest of the globe. And the takeaway for Jeremiah is that God was disappointed with Judah and had to refashion us. This seems a regular theme in the scriptures. Moses and God had a discussion about Israel being resistant to the Lord, and God wanted to wipe them out and restart a new community beginning with Moses, not Abraham, as the father of the new people. Moses rejected that one. Isaiah certainly had much to say in comparing Israel with a lump of potter's creations in chapters 29 and 30 and a few other places. And Jeremiah will again address this in next week's chapter and in the book of Lamentations, chapter 4. And then finally, Daniel and Zechariah also use this metaphor of the potter in the Older Testament. The Newer Testament makes mention of this scene in Revelation chapter 2, but is most famously used by Rabbi Saul, uh, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans in chapter 9. We'll visit that one in a few minutes. First, let me highlight a couple of Hebrew words in the opening of this chapter. Here in verse 2, it says, there I will announce my words to you. But the Hebrew has at its root the word Shema, meaning to hear. In God's announcement, he both hears and invites the listener, Jeremiah, to hear what God has to say. I, I take this on board every time I open the Bible to teach others. I want to learn as well. Another phrase is the one in verse 4 about the pleasure of the potter. The word is not the usual word for pleasure. It's the word yashar that usually means to smooth, but has by extension come to mean pleased. And that makes sense in light of the artisan making a new product, and it turns out well. As a bonus, not related to our study today, later on I want you to read Psalm 17. I'm just going to give you one verse from it, verse 15, but read the whole psalm. The Hebrew word is not the same, but I ponder this a lot. It says in Psalm, 15, in Psalm 17, verse 15, But as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. If you turn those phrases a bit, it works for me. 
and this is how I first learned it, I think in the King James, I will be satisfied when I awake with your likeness. Today I'm content, Paul wrote to Timothy, but I'm not yet satisfied. I will be satisfied one day. What day is that? When I awake looking like Yeshua. And when, when will that be? 1 John 3 said it. We studied it a few months ago. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, we'll be like him, because we will see him just as he is. When will I be like him? When will I be satisfied? When he returns. When I awake in your likeness. Well, that's just a bonus for those learning this chapter with us today. Back to the potter's wheel. One more Hebrew word, it's in verse 4. The word spoiled is shachat in Hebrew, the same verb used about the linen waistcloth or skirt we learned about in chapter 13, that Jeremiah was told to go buy and then bury in the dirt, basically ruin. The same despoilment that happened to the skirt is happening to the pot, and God is showing Jeremiah the ruin in the Jewish people, and it is complete. It is irreparable as is. A new thing has to be produced. Something may be similar, but different. Now let's look at that Pauline comment in Romans 9. It stems from this one verse in verse 18 about the sovereignty of God. Paul wrote, so then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Paul uses Pharaoh as an example, and the stumbling stone, Hebrew word evan, same as in the potter's wheel, it's really the potter's evan, because it was a stone wheel, will trip up the Jewish people who do not seek God by faith. The issue in Romans 9 is that God will do whatever he wants to do, and that he can do that because he is the potter. There are people who submit to his molding and they succeed. There are people who resist the molding and they fail. Paul says that those who resist cannot say to the potter, hey, why'd you make me like this? The issue is always the same throughout the scriptures. We're sinful. We choose our own way. And when that happens, the potter has the right. And sometimes we dare him and we say, you have the obligation to start over and reboot. He can, and we sometimes think he should wipe out the resistant clay. But here's the glory of God. He saves some. He expresses his kindness again and again. In chapter 9 of Romans, verses 22 and on, it says this, God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience, vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he also called not only from among the Jews, but also from among the Gentiles. The glory of God is manifest in the salvation of people, all people who were destined for a sad and hopeless ending and yet, in his mercy, God saved us. <laughs> what an awesome God we have. What hope everyone who today puts their trust in him can experience. Back to our text in Jeremiah, chapter 18. We're still there, verses 5 and following. God says, I can do what I want. If I've promised penalty to the disobedient, and then they repent, then I can have mercy, as he also said in Romans 9 and Hosea. And similarly, God says, if I've promised good and the people live wrongly, I can pour out judgment on that people. Warren Wiersbe says of this, quote, God neither changes in character nor needs to repent of his actions, but he has the sovereign freedom to alter his actions depending on the responses of the people, end quote. 
Similarly, Christopher Wright concludes this section with a comparison with Isaiah's use of the metaphor. He says, Chris Wright says this, quote, we should not jump to equate it with what Isaiah has to say using the same imagery. Isaiah's point is that it is ludicrous to imagine clay questioning or criticizing a potter's work. So Israel has no right to disagree with God's plan to use Cyrus as his agent of redemption. God is sovereign. Jeremiah's point is different, Chris Wright says. He is not so much focusing on the sovereign will of the potter as on the responsibility of the clay and on God's freedom to change his plans according to what the clay does, end quote. The conclusion of this story is in verse 11. What is nationally true of Judah on the potter's wheel now becomes personal in each individual Israelite. The application has to be one by one. We already know that Judah is going into captivity. That's been clear all along. But what about Mrs. Goldberg or Shimon Bar Yosef or any individual Jewish person or you, what will you do in light of the reboot of the Jewish people? It's here in verse 11, V'choshev alechem machashava, shuvu na ish, medarko hara'ava hativu darchechem. He says this, I'm fashioning calamity or evil, ra'a, against you. And choshev machashava, I'm thinking a thought, I'm devising a plan against you. So what does he say? Shuvu, na, na, na is that word that you might have learned from Amy Grant when she sang Erkam Kana Adonai. The word na means it's an appeal, it's oh, it's a longing. Shuvu, the command, turn back, ish, each one of you from his evil way. Behetivu darchechem, and make good or reform your ways. Uh, the word ish stands out, really stands out. I'll tell you why in a couple ways. The rabbis use trope marks, the tamim, to help us cantillate and learn more about the readings. And here the yitiv trope is used. It's It's like a single yelp of a dog. It's like a Yo, in Philadelphia, it's a don't miss this. And as such, it stands out to me. And then it's the word ish, meaning one man. So he's talking to, to Judah, but he's almost saying every one of you, each of you is what our version translates it. It's a call to individual responsibility, to live for God, to honor God in your own life and vahitivu, make tov, make good, translated here, reform your ways. From one bad way, or lots of bad ways really, to the good way. Let me be clear how one goes from the bad way to the good way. It is not in behavior. It is not in mitzvot. It's not in fasting or in prayer. It's not in religion, not at all. The answer, is the potter's wheel. The bad way is the way of resistance. Think of Satan who opposes the good way. He resists it. To resist is to stand against something. The clay that resists is the clay that refuses to be molded. The clay that succeeds is the clay that allows. That is a picture of the biblical use of faith and trust in God. The clay doesn't perform until much later when it becomes an object for ordinary or spectacular use. The key in this passage, and dare I say in the entire biblical narrative, is that the faith-filled clay is the one who allows and does not resist the potter. Give yourself to the Lord. Allow him to shape and reshape you to his purposes. Then when you awake in his likeness, you will be satisfied. Amen. Christopher Wright uses the term responsive sovereignty 
to explain this God potter wheel clay reality. Five times in this section in chapters 18 and into 19, the use of the word machshavot, thoughts, plans, make this one unit of Jeremiah's <laughs> machshavot, thoughts. Remember the book of Proverbs says, as a man thinks within himself, so he is. That was used a hundred years ago by a British self-help writer named James Allen. But I'm using it here to highlight Jeremiah saying this to Judah. Come on, folks, get this right. Think right. Believe right. Work with me here. This, this can change for you. But the people of the prophet turn on him. And it was, as a result, he turns on them. And that's the second part of today's lesson from verses 18 to 23, the imprecatory prayer. It's actually the fifth of Jeremiah's personal laments so far in the book, and there's more to come. Imprecatory prayer seems out of bounds to us in the new covenant, but reality bites, you know. There is a cause that goes too far. In the same way that God is long-suffering, so is Jeremiah. But long-suffering is not permanent suffering. There comes an end to the suffering. The patience of anyone runs out in due course. And thus here again, Jeremiah is at the end of his tether, end of his patience, end of hope for Judah. Look at the triple plot there in verses 18, 19, and 23 against the prophet. First, they wanted to devise plans, chashev, to think machshavot thoughts against him. Basically, a whispering campaign of propaganda in order to create a public rejection of what he's teaching. Second, they're going to take him to the court system and accuse him. That's what the word oppose in verse 19 seems to mean. They oppose him legally. That takes it from gossip to a legal failing and thus ridicule religiously. Third, and finally in verse 23, they want to kill him. Assassination is the final remedy of removing him from the scene. Of note are two things. One, the power structure that they reference, the religion folks, the academics, and the government all are sources of confidence and assurance, even though Jeremiah says they're all wrong. To this day, we still gain our insights about life from wrong sources. God alone is to be trusted, and we regularly have to adjust our minds and hearts to that. Second, the imprecatory prayer of verses 19 and following seems out of character with the weeping prophet, but it's not. His emotion is real. Be angry and yet do not sin, we read both in Psalm 4 and in Ephesians 4. There comes a time when you've just had enough. You, epic, you, you explode a bit or, or a lot. And then please, the writers would say, don't stay angry. Don't remain in that emotion overnight. Don't live there, James would caution. The psalmists cry out with this unfair pain in Psalm 35, in 58, and in 109. It's as if he's saying, I, Jeremiah is saying, I worked so hard to be your kind of person among them, and look, look how they treat me. If Jeremiah didn't care so much, he would have just walked away without incident. But his love and passion for Judah is evident, and it caused even more pain. The end? Bring it on, God. Smash them. Ruin them. They deserve it. I'm done. But dear friends on this Zoom call and those who will watch this on YouTube later, this is not the end. Our model of endurance is not Jeremiah who exploded in vile imprecation. Our new model is the gentle and lowly Messiah, Yeshua who on being met with assassination attempts and emotional blackmail of being dobbed in for punishment by those closest to him, turned and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. 
Last week, across the world, we began Passover, and tonight is the last night. Last week was also Good Friday. Good Friday. On that day, Yeshua, our beloved one, died on a Roman cross instead of bringing out the troops to self-defend. He could have called for myriads of angels and bring his enemies to despair. Instead, he died for our sins and took our punishment on himself. He heard the gossip and the ridicule, even legal dismissals. And yet he loved us enough to go to the cross and die. For us, no imprecatory prayer by Yeshua, no rejection of his own. And then he died and then he was buried. Entombment, a real the end could have been written on the grave. The movie could have ended the end. Well, that was a good story. Sorry it didn't make it. But then Sunday came. And sometime between the burial on Friday and the resurrection on Sunday, Yeshua rolled away the stone. Or maybe an angel did. Or maybe 10 angels. We don't know. But there was a seal around that tomb so that it was impossible for any human to break that, it had the mark of the Roman emperor. You couldn't change that. You couldn't mess with it. There was a guard stationed in front of it. No one, no human would have taken, would have gathered the nerve enough to go up against those Roman soldiers. There's stories told about how his disciples came and stole away the body. Have they read the story of the disciples, how they cowered in fear immediately after the story of the resurrection was, ex was explained, how they ran away at the crucifixion itself? No, those were not the brave ones. Those were not the ones who moved the stone. So an angel moved a stone and Yeshua folded, I love that, folded his garments in which he'd been laid and he rose. And different ones saw him. 500 Jewish people saw him after that resurrection. Some ate with him. Hmm. Imprecatory, no, that's not how he wanted to live. He wanted to go all the way to the cross, all the way to the tomb, all the way to the, to the empty tomb, so that he could honestly be called our savior. No rejection of his own. Hallelujah. What a savior.